a sign of societal decay, another sign that our civilization is in serious decline. Did you know that an MIT study from the 1970s predicted societal collapse around 2040? Recent analyses suggest these predictions are on track. But here's the kicker. 90% of people aren't ready for it. Are you part of the prepared minority? Think about it. Reason number 10. Over-reliance on technology. Think about your day. How many times do you check your phone? Use your computer. Rely on GPS. Now imagine all of that. Gone. No internet, no electricity, no digital anything. Scary, right? Our modern world runs on tech. It's great when it works, but it's a massive weakness when it doesn't. Remember the Northeast blackout of 2003? 50 million people lost power for up to two days. Chaos ensued. Now multiply that by weeks, months, or even years. That's what we're talking about here. But here's the thing. You can prepare. Start small. Learn to read a paper map. Practice basic math without a calculator. Write things down instead of relying on digital notes. It's not about going off-grid today. It's about being ready if you need to. Moving on to reason number nine, lack of basic survival skills. When was the last time you started a fire without matches? Preserved food without a fridge? Treated a wound without a first aid kit? For most people, the answer is never. These skills used to be common knowledge, now they're practically lost arts. In a collapse, knowing how to purify water could save your life. Understanding basic first aid could be the difference between life and death. The good news? You can start learning these skills today. Take a wilderness survival course. Learn basic first aid. Start a small garden. Every skill you learn puts you ahead of the curve. Reason number eight, limited resource stockpiles. Our modern supply chains are marvels of efficiency, but they're also incredibly fragile. Most grocery stores only have about three days' worth of food. What happens when those shelves are empty and stay that way? The just-in-time inventory system means most people don't have adequate supplies for extended emergencies. Think about your own pantry. How long could you feed yourself and your family if the stores close tomorrow? Building a stockpile doesn't mean becoming a hardcore prepper overnight. Start small. Each time you shop, buy a little extra of non-perishable items. Rotate your stock. Before you know it, you'll have a solid emergency supply. And now, reason number seven, psychological unpreparedness. This one's tricky because it's all in your head. It's called normalcy bias, the belief that things will always function the way they normally have. It's why people stay in their homes during hurricane warnings or ignore evacuation orders during wildfires. This bias is powerful. It prevents people from acknowledging the possibility of societal collapse. It leads to complacency and a lack of preparation. After all, why prepare for something that could never happen? Breaking free from normalcy bias is tough. It requires facing uncomfortable truths. Start by educating yourself about historical collapses. Study how societies break down. Understanding the possibilities is the first step to preparing for them. These reasons might seem overwhelming, but remember, knowledge is power. By understanding these vulnerabilities, you're already ahead of most people. You're taking the first steps towards being part of that 10% who might just make it. Let's keep moving down our list of reasons why most people won't make it in a societal collapse. We're about to hit some big ones, so pay close attention. Reason number six, isolation and lack of community. Think about your neighbors. Do you know their names? When was the last time you had a real conversation with them? In our modern world, we've become increasingly isolated. We live in our own bubbles, often disconnected from those around us. But here's the thing. In a collapsed scenario, your community could be your lifeline. Historically, tight-knit communities have been more resilient in the face of disasters. They share resources, knowledge, and support each other through tough times. Imagine facing a crisis alone versus having a network of people you can rely on. Big difference, right? So what can you do? Start small. Get to know your neighbors. Join local community groups. Volunteer. Build those connections now, before you need them. Remember, a strong community isn't just about survival, it's about thriving in the face of adversity. Moving on to reason number five, dependency on global supply chains. Our modern world is incredibly interconnected. 
That shirt you're wearing? It probably traveled thousands of miles before it reached you. The food in your fridge? Same story. We rely on a complex web of global trade for almost everything we use daily. But what happens when those supply chains break down? Suddenly, local self-sufficiency becomes crucial, and most of us aren't prepared for that. We're used to having everything at our fingertips, just a click away. In a collapsed scenario, that convenience disappears overnight. The solution? Start thinking local. Support local farmers and businesses. Learn about the resources available in your area. Consider learning skills that could be valuable in a local economy. The more self-sufficient your community is, the better you'll weather a global crisis. Now, reason number four, inadequate physical fitness. Let's be honest, many of us lead pretty sedentary lives. We sit at desks, drive everywhere, and rely on machines to do a lot of our physical work. But in a post-collapse world, physical fitness could mean the difference between life and death. Imagine having to walk miles to find food or water, or needing to build shelter with your bare hands. How would your body hold up? For many people, the answer isn't great. Our modern lifestyles simply haven't prepared us for the physical demands of survival. The good news is, you can start changing this today. You don't need to become a marathon runner overnight. Start with small, consistent changes. Take regular walks. Learn a practical skill that requires physical effort, like gardening or woodworking. Every bit of improvement puts you ahead of the curve. Now let's talk about something called critical slowing down. It's a concept scientists use to predict collapses in complex systems, including societies. Imagine a healthy rainforest. When it faces a disruption, like a storm, it bounces back quickly. But as it becomes less resilient, it takes longer to recover between shocks. That's critical slowing down. We can see this happening in our society today. Economic crises, pandemics, climate disasters. Each one seems to hit harder than the last, and we take longer to recover. It's like our societal rainforest is losing its resilience. This ties directly into the reasons we've discussed. Isolated individuals, broken communities, fragile supply chains, and a physically unprepared population. All these factors make our society less able to bounce back from shocks. Each crisis leaves us a little more vulnerable to the next one. The final three reasons why most people won't make it in a societal collapse are some of the most crucial. Let's dive in. Reason number three, environmental ignorance. Think about where your food comes from. Do you know which plants in your area are edible? Could you identify poisonous berries? In our modern world, we've become disconnected from nature. We've forgotten the knowledge our ancestors relied on to survive. Imagine a scenario where grocery stores are empty. Suddenly knowing your local ecosystem becomes a matter of life and death. You need to know which plants are safe to eat, where to find clean water, and how to navigate using natural landmarks. But for most people, this knowledge is completely foreign. The solution? Start learning about your local environment now. Take nature walks, learn to identify plants, study the wildlife in your area. This knowledge isn't just useful in a collapsed scenario, it can enrich your life right now. Moving on to reason number two, financial instability. Let's face it, many of us are living paycheck to paycheck. We're drowning in debt with little to no savings. In a stable society, we can usually get by. But what happens when that stability disappears? Financial fragility leaves us vulnerable. When the system collapses, money might become worthless overnight. Those with high debts and no savings will be hit hardest. They'll have no resources to fall back on, no buffer against the chaos. So what can you do? Start building your financial resilience today. Pay down debt, build an emergency fund, consider investing in tangible assets that might hold value in a crisis. It's not about becoming wealthy, it's about creating a safety net. Now we've reached reason number one, failure to adapt. This is the big one. It's what separates those who survive from those who don't. In a collapse scenario, everything changes, fast. The rules you've lived by your whole life might suddenly become irrelevant. Imagine waking up one day to find that money is worthless, food is scarce, and the government has collapsed. How quickly could you adjust? 
Could you change your entire way of thinking and living overnight? For most people, the answer is no. We're creatures of habit. We resist change. But in a collapsed scenario, those who can't adapt quickly won't survive. It's that simple. So how do you prepare for this? Practice flexibility in your thinking. Challenge your assumptions. Try new things. The more adaptable you are in your everyday life, the better you'll handle major changes. Now let's talk about something called catabolic capitalism. It's a concept that describes how capitalism might eat itself in times of scarcity. Imagine a scenario where resources are becoming scarce. Instead of conserving what's left, the system accelerates consumption, trying to maintain growth at all costs. It's like burning the furniture to heat the house. It works for a while, but eventually you run out of furniture. This process could accelerate societal breakdown. As resources become scarcer, competition intensifies. Social structures break down. It's a downward spiral that's hard to stop once it starts. Now, all of this might sound overwhelming. You might be thinking, how can I possibly prepare for all of this? But here's the thing. You don't have to do everything at once. Small steps, taken consistently, can make a big difference. All right, we've covered the reasons why most people won't make it in a collapse. But here's the good news. You don't have to be one of them. Let's turn this around and count down the steps you can take to boost your chances of survival. Number 10. Break free from technology dependence. Remember how we talked about the chaos that could ensue without our gadgets? It's time to build some tech-free skills. Start small. Once a week, have a no-tech evening. Read a paper book play board games, or just talk with your family. Learn to navigate with a paper map and compass. Practice mental math. These simple steps can make a big difference in your ability to function without technology. Number nine, develop basic survival skills. This is where things get exciting. Sign up for a wilderness survival course. Learn how to start a fire without matches, purify water, and identify edible plants. Practice these skills regularly. Make it a family activity. Not only will you be better prepared, but you'll also have fun doing it. Number eight, build your resource stockpile. Start with a 72-hour emergency kit, then gradually expand it. Each time you grocery shop, buy a few extra non-perishable items. Rotate your stock to keep it fresh. Don't forget water. Aim for at least one gallon per person per day. Remember, it's not about hoarding, it's about being prepared. Number seven, strengthen your mind. Psychological preparedness is crucial. Start by educating yourself about historical collapses and how people survive them. Practice mindfulness to improve your ability to stay calm under pressure. Engage in problem-solving games or puzzles to keep your mind sharp and adaptable. Number six, build your community. This is where the Deep Adaptation Framework comes in. It emphasizes the importance of community resilience. Get to know your neighbors, organize community events, join local groups or start your own. The stronger your community bonds, the better you'll all fare in a crisis. Number five, localize your supply chain. Start supporting local farmers and businesses. Learn about the resources available in your area. Consider learning a trade that could be valuable in a local economy. The more self-sufficient your community is, the less impact a global crisis will have on you. Number four, improve your physical fitness. You don't need to become a triathlete overnight. Start with daily walks. Learn a practical skill that requires physical effort, like gardening or carpentry. Regular exercise will not only prepare you for the physical demands of survival, but also improve your overall health and resilience. Number three, Connect with your environment. Take nature walks and learn to identify local plants and animals. Study the natural water sources in your area. Learn about local weather patterns. This knowledge will be invaluable if you ever need to rely on your environment for survival. Number two, build financial resilience. Start by creating a budget and sticking to it. Pay down debt and build an emergency fund. Consider investing in tangible assets that might hold value in a crisis, like tools or land. Remember, financial preparedness isn't about getting rich. It's about creating a safety net. Number one, cultivate adaptability. This is the most important skill of all. 
regularly challenge yourself to learn new things. Try new experiences. Practice problem solving in unfamiliar situations. The more flexible and adaptable you are in your daily life, the better you'll handle major changes. Now let's talk about the DEEP Adaptation Framework. It's not just about surviving. It's about adapting to a changing world. It emphasizes learning old skills for self-sufficiency, like food preservation or natural building techniques. But it also stresses the importance of community and cooperation. One follower of DEEP Adaptation, Rachel Ingrams, invested in a greenhouse and learned foraging skills. She says, it's not just about surviving, it's about creating a life that's worth living, even in challenging circumstances. Remember, every step you take towards preparedness puts you ahead of the curve. You don't have to do everything at once. Start small, but start today. Remember, preparedness isn't about fear. It's about resilience. It's about building a life that can weather any storm. Think about it. Every skill you learn, every connection you make, every step you take towards self-sufficiency, it all adds up. You're not just preparing for some far-off disaster. You're creating a more fulfilling, connected life right now. So here's your challenge. Start today. Pick one small thing from what we've discussed and do it. Maybe it's learning to identify a local plant or reaching out to a neighbor. Whatever it is, take that first step. If you'd like to learn about the 14 foods the Red Cross urges you to stockpile for emergencies, click the video on screen now.